I'm Michelle Ackerley. My parents both grew up on council estates, and as a family, we understand the difference social housing can make to people's lives. But across the UK, there's a chronic shortage of council and housing association homes. I know so many friends and so many people that just literally don't have anywhere to live. Adding to the crisis, some tenants are abusing the system, holding onto properties they no longer need, or even worse, unlawfully subletting them and coining in a small fortune. Subletting social housing is wrong. It's wrong, it's illegal, and it's wrong. So every day we'll be with the housing investigators as they crack down on those rogue tenants. Can you go bear lives? Reclaim properties. Anybody here? and give them to families in genuine need. All of those keys are yours. Oh, don't, because you'll start me off again. This is Council House Crackdown. Our reporter, property expert Luke Doonan, also grew up on a council estate. And for the last six months, he's been working alongside dedicated housing investigators who will stop at nothing to track down every single tenant who's abusing the system. Today, a fraudster who claimed she and her children were homeless to get this council house is sentenced after being caught renting out her two private homes. She's got this property that she's renting out £400 a month and that money's going straight into her pocket. The married man who said he was single just so he could keep his council flat and then let his teenage son and friends run riot in it. And they're actually renting out this property to young people. The address was nothing more than a DOS house and the prisoner from East London who's been coining it subletting his social housing property while still behind bars. That is the bank account statement showing that the money was going into that account. There are 26.4 million households in the UK and nearly a fifth of those are social housing. But there are over one and a half million households on housing waiting lists. So it's vital social housing goes to the right people. The vast majority of those on social housing are law-abiding, responsible people. But there are some who use their council or housing association property as a passport to making money. Our first case involves a fraudster who claimed she and her children were homeless in order to get a council house in Solihull while all the while owning not one, but two private properties in neighbouring Birmingham. Luke's meeting Solihull Council Senior Auditor Sean Turley, who is the lead investigator on the case. Solihull Council runs a fraud hotline, and that's how they first heard about Dawn Hipkiss, the perpetrator of Sean's biggest ever tenancy fraud case. It's, um, it's some audacity on her part. In 2010, Miss Hipkiss contacted Solihull Council, saying she and her two children were about to become homeless. She uh, completed a homeless application form uh, with ourselves. She applied with um, her two young children, and so we allocated her a property. I guess she's going to go to the top yeah, of the queue. Yeah, most definitely. The council acted quickly and housed her here in this substantial three-bedroom home on the outskirts of Solly Hull. But in 2014, Sean's team received an anonymous call. We had a really good tip-off from a member of the public. Uh, they phoned into our hotline, um, provided a number of details to us, um, stating that um, our tenant, Dawn Hipkiss, actually owned a property in Birmingham right. um, that she, she was renting out. Sean immediately started an investigation. In order to be eligible for council accommodation, it's a condition that you cannot own another property. So Sean contacted a colleague in Birmingham City Council. We approached Birmingham to try and substantiate the information that uh, the hotline caller had provided us with and um, found out that she'd actually purchased a property from Birmingham Council um, through the right to buy scheme. It was this three-bedroomed house, and she'd bought this property in 2005, a full five years before she told Solihull she needed a council house because she was homeless. She was eligible to buy it because she'd been living in it as a council tenant. She'd been um, a wow. tenant with Birmingham um, for about five or six years, so she was entitled to the full um, discount on purchasing that property. 
the property she bought in Birmingham was valued at £70,000. That's correct. She yeah. received a 35% discount of 24,500. That's right. So yeah. she ended up buying the property off Birmingham Council for 45 and a half thousand pounds. That's correct. That's some discount, isn't it? Yeah. As Sean dug deeper, he discovered that Miss Hipkiss was letting this property in Birmingham, a fact that came to light because she was renting to housing benefit claimants and Birmingham Council had their records. She's got this property that she's renting out around uh, 400 pounds a month is what she's charging the uh, the tenants mm. and that money's going straight into her pocket. A land registry search confirmed Miss Hipkiss as the sole proprietor of the Birmingham address. It was enough to bring her in for formal questioning. She uh, turned up on the first occasion with her solicitor. We got an interview under caution plan, number of questions, possible defences that she uh, she could come up with, mm. um, number of questions we wanted to ask her. And she uh, no commented throughout um, the interview, um, wow. refused to answer any questions. With Dawn Hipkiss giving investigators the silent treatment, further investigations got underway, and they revealed a bigger surprise. The next step was to get her bank statements um, to show that she was receiving a rental income for that property. Um, and lo and behold, um, that showed that she'd got this um, monthly rental income coming in for the property that we knew of in Birmingham, right. but not only that property, another property no. that she was renting out. Really? Um, yeah. A second, so she owns a second property? That's, that's right, yeah. She used the proceeds from the first one to then finance the purchasing of the second property. So Miss Hipkiss was raking in rent money from two properties in Birmingham. Her income is eight, nine hundred pounds a month in yeah. rent yeah. from those two properties. It turned out Dawn Hipkiss bought this house, her second Birmingham property, in 2007. So when she claimed to be homeless, she in fact owned two houses. Absolutely disgusting behaviour yeah. on every single level. Yeah, yeah. Miss Hipkiss seemed to be building a property portfolio, owning and renting out two houses in Birmingham while living in her council house in Solihull. But there was more. On being allocated the property in Solihull, she actually put in a benefit application to the council, so she was paid full housing benefit um, against the rent that she should have been paid, should have been really? paid for that property, and full uh, council tax benefit, so she wasn't paying any council tax either. I don't know what to say to that. She completed um, a benefit application here, um, and again, on this form, it asks for the um, applicant's circumstances. All details are provided, questions are asked. Do you own any other property? And she has ticked no. The evidence was damning. Sean and his team served a notice to quit, and in September 2015, Dawn Hipkiss was evicted from her council home here in Solihull. It was the beginning of the end for Miss Hipkiss's property empire. She stopped paying the mortgages on her houses in Birmingham, and they were repossessed by the banks. Dawn Hipkiss was prosecuted for two counts of fraud at Birmingham Crown Court in November last year and was given a six-month prison sentence, suspended for 12 months and a 12-month supervision order. The council is currently awaiting a hearing in the civil courts to reclaim the proceeds Miss Hipkiss made from her crimes. Meanwhile, the Solihull Council House has been relet. This is the house here, this three bed. Wow. Um, semi detached. That's um it's pretty impressive, isn't it? Very nice house, very nice area. What's the situation with the, the tenancy of the house at the moment? We've got a single parent um, family um, living in the property. Um, and they're, they're very happy in there. They moved in just before Christmas. Congratulations on, Thank you. on getting the property back. The fraud in housing is just unbelievable. It's reached such high levels now. People see renting out their own council house as a way of making money. How wicked is that? One, they should evict them. Two, they should not house them at all. Three, they should make them homeless. Take it off them, without a doubt, because they've profited long enough. And at the end of the day, this is probably, I would say, 
is one of the largest contributing factors to the problems that we have today. I think the government should send out those officers that work in the councils to go out and find those people, prosecute them for doing such things and charge this exorbitant amount of rent. They should cave back all of those rents that they pay for, for they charge those people and to get back that money. Housing tenancy fraud costs social landlords an estimated £1.8 billion every year. As a deterrent, the Social Housing Fraud Act of 2013 allows councils to seek tough penalties against those who knowingly deceive the system. If convicted, tenants can be punished with up to two years in prison, a fine of up to £50,000 and be ordered to repay any profits from the fraud that the court deems appropriate. In February 2008, a man obtained a flat from Milton Keynes Council after claiming to be homeless. In reality, he had an existing social tenancy with a housing association in another area, which he deliberately concealed during his application. In 2014, he was sentenced to 11 weeks custody, suspended for 12 months, 150 hours of community service, and ordered to pay costs of 1,000 £362 to Milton Keynes Council. Here in Aylesbury, Buckinghamshire, there are two and a half thousand families waiting for social housing. So the last thing that housing officers want is someone to be using more than one home, which is exactly what was happening in our next case. This is a story of one man's selfish use of a two-bed housing association flat, letting his 16-year-old son and his friends stay there, while all the time living with his wife in another social property elsewhere. Not only that, but the man in question denied he was married in order to get the flat in the first place. In December 2012, a 44-year-old man moved into this two-bedroom flat in Aylesbury, he claimed he was a single parent, living with his teenage son. But by January last year, neighbours were complaining about noise and antisocial behaviour coming from the flat. Vale of Aylesbury Housing Trust investigator Craig was put on the case. The initial report related to noise nuisance and young people using that property. Um, we didn't really know for what purpose. Craig asked the neighbour who'd complained to keep a diary detailing any disturbances. So this is a, um, a diary sheet. We encourage complainants to fill out these forms as and when an incident will occur. Date, time, what occurred. Now these forms become legal documents, so it's very important that they uh, get as much detail in there as possible. The noise coming from the flat suggested it was being used by a group of young people for socialising and late night parties. The diary sheets were very detailed and I could see that she was referring to a group of young people. The report consisted of late night parties, um, high level of pedestrian traffic. When Cray checked housing association records, he discovered that the lawful tenant was a 44-year-old divorcee who had a 16-year-old son. Having carried out um, tenancy checks, I could be sure that there was a, um, a young boy living there at some point with, with the dad, who was a lawful tenant. The young boy, to our knowledge, he shouldn't be living there. He was living with mum at another address, but um, as families do, um, they move around a little bit and uh, in all likelihood, it's probably the son that was living there. Social media is often a valuable source of information for housing investigators, and so it proved in this case. Craig found a Facebook account for both the father and his son. The information on the accounts led Craig to suspect that the son was living at the flat, but that his father, the tenant, had moved out. If this was the case, it would be a breach of tenancy and would be classed as unlawful subletting. I uh, went onto Facebook, I found Dad, I found the son. I could come to the assumption quite easily that the son was actually living at that address. Individuals tend to use social media quite a lot and tell the world what it is they're up to on a daily basis. Um, and if perpetrators are silly enough to use social media, then I'm going to be the one monitoring them. Thanks to the Social Housing Fraud Act of 2013, Craig was also able to look at his tenants' financial records. Some of the information that I can find out is um, information relating to bank accounts, um, whether they've had any loan agreements, money in applications for a loan. These financial checks provided another vital lead. The official tenant had recently made a joint application for a bank loan. 
the second name on the application was that of a woman, which suggested to Craig that the tenant may be in a relationship. It's a female I hadn't heard of before, but I suspect this female was uh, a partner or maybe even an ex-partner, but I needed to find out who she was. Cray decided to follow his hunch and check the tenant's name against marriage records. I then applied for a marriage certificate, not knowing that he would be married, but I wanted to see whether there was one that existed. Um, and I received a marriage certificate, and it came up with the same name that was on the application that he made for a loan. Craig had uncovered the truth about his tenant. He wasn't single at all, but had in fact got married in August 2012, shortly before he took over the tenancy at the flat. Prospective social housing tenants are required to notify the council or housing association about any changes that may affect their need for housing while they're waiting on the housing list. That would include having a baby, a child moving out, and getting married or divorced. In this case, the tenant had lied about being single, when in fact, he was married. We're just wondering why he's not told us that he's married when it's quite clear that he is. Um, we feel that he's hiding something. I want to know a bit more about the wife, who she is, are they still together, um, and uh, where does she live? Is she local? Craig started to go through council tax records and discovered the tenant's new wife also had a social housing property just four miles away. I managed to find out who she is through council tax. I did a, a check with the local authority, um, and she is paying council tax and registered at another house in Aylesbury with her children. So it looked as if between them, this married couple had not one, but two housing association properties. Then Craig looked again at their marriage certificate and noticed that on the certificate, they'd both provided yet another address, this time in Milton Keynes. And when Craig checked this address, he discovered that it too was a social housing property. The another point of the certificate, there's an address in Milton Keynes, which they are connected to. So I wanted to find out through Milton Keynes, um, what address is that? Is it a private dwelling? Do they own that property? Um, but I actually found out through, through Milton Keynes Council that it's actually a local authority property um, and he's still registered to live in there. What had started out as a routine noise complaint had now become an investigation into a tenant with links to three social housing properties. It indicates to me that uh, the tenant actually has access to three social housing properties, uh, one of which is in Milton Keynes uh, and then two more in Aylesbury, one of which is a property that he's living at with his family and the other one is the address that he should be living at, which we suspect his son is living at the moment. Later, we find out what happened when the police were called to help clear the flat that should have been home to a single parent and his son. And he's actually renting out this property to young people aged between 15 and 17 years old. The address was nothing more than a DOS house. I'm very grateful for social housing. I've been, since I was 16, um, I went to go apply for housing and was helped in various ways. Um, and if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be living near my family um, or able to do what I do for a living, which is I'm a minicab driver. I have friends who've been on waiting lists for housing for more than eight years, and I don't see that they have any other option but to wait. It's quite distressing. We've been waiting there for the past four years now, for waiting to be moved, because the housing where we are is too small. Yeah, and it's, there is um, seven of us in the family, right? And, and then we've got to live in a three-bedroom house, which is not really fair. The government expects local authorities to give certain groups of people priority and move them to the top of their housing lists. These groups include people who are homeless, those who served in the armed forces, and people with some medical conditions. The government also expects councils to give priority to former prisoners because it's been shown that ex-offenders are 20% less likely to re-offend if they have stable accommodation. But councils can decide for themselves which groups to give priority to in their area. With its vibrant mix of people and the Olympic Park and Canary Wharf on its doorstep, it's no surprise that there are people queuing up to live in the East London borough of Tower Hamlets. You'd have to be incredibly lucky to get a social housing flat like this here, though. There are currently around 20,000 people on the waiting list. 
But one tenant who lived here threw it all away by renting out his flat while he was in prison. Luke's meeting up with Avril Drummond. Avril is counter fraud investigator for the Housing Association Poplar Harker. Hi, Avril. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. Standing here, a lot of people looking at this block, you wouldn't even think it was a social housing block. It's actually quite stunning, isn't it? It's very nice. It's a new build. They're very nice properties. Lovely views. Very close to Canary Wharf, yeah. close to the city. Good transport links. So I mean, it's an ideal property. The lucky tenant who did move in in 2012 was a former prisoner. But 18 months later, he was back in prison and trying to make a profit by illegally renting his flat out while he was behind bars. How in demand are one-bedroom flats like this for, for people who We've are on the waiting thousands list? thousands of people on the, on the waiting list um, in this borough, 20,000 people on the list. Mm, um, but for one-bedroom properties, I'd say up to about 9,000, 10,000 people. After only three months in her new job at the Housing Association, Avril was contacted by a neighbour who said they thought the flat was being sublet. So Avril started making inquiries. We received a tip off from a neighbour that the property was being sublet by the lawful tenant, so we started investigating. At first, it seemed like the neighbour might have been mistaken. I carried out some initial checks um, and the lawful tenant, to all intents and purposes, looked like he was living in the property. He was on the electoral roll, all his um, uh, financial details linked him to the property. But Avril is nothing if not thorough and went back further. She discovered that there'd been allegations of subletting before. I also look back through the history of the tenancy. There had been previous allegations and quite a lot of evidence that um, the property had been previously sublet. The records show that the official tenant had contacted the Housing Association two years earlier to tell them he was going back to prison and asking if his father could look after the flat while he was inside. The Housing Association had agreed, but then Avril found a statement that suggested the flat had been sublet while a tenant was in prison. There was an agreement that his father would look after the property for him, but the father had sublet it. The tenant denied he had knowledge of it because obviously he was um, serving time. We got a witness statement from the subtenant. Okay. And it actually shows that he was paying rent of £800 a month. He was giving the um, rent money to the lawful tenant's girlfriend. Here it says um, payment would be made to this. The following day, we met her at a venue in Shepherd's Bush. We did not have £1,600, so gave her £800 in cash mm -hmm. and left a passport of security. A couple of days later, we met up with the young lady at this time at her business premises in E1. We signed an agreement and were given keys to the flat. It's a very evidential witness statement. It's very, it? it's very clear. It's very black and white. Just the way the girlfriend is meeting them, She's taking someone's passport as mm -hmm. security. It's almost like they're, they're running it as a... Well, they are running it as a, a business, aren't they, really? Well, they were at the time, yes. That is the receipt here on the bank account Sorry statement that? showing that the money was going into that account. Oh, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Of yeah. the tenant's name. So he was actually account. in prison, and then yeah. you can see money going into yeah. his account. So he can't deny knowledge. He must have known why suddenly large sums of money were being paid into his account. So it was clear the official tenant had a history of subletting his flat and pocketing the profits. It wasn't investigated at the time because before the 2013 Prevention of Housing Fraud Act, most housing associations didn't have a dedicated investigations team. Poplar Harker was no exception. By this stage, the prisoner was due to be released from jail, so Avril's next step was to go to the flat to see if he was back living there. And if he wasn't, then to find out who was. We decided to conduct an early morning visit. It took me about a month before finally, um, around about July, we actually found somebody in the property. But it wasn't Avril's official tenant, the ex-prisoner. It was someone she hadn't seen before, who claimed he had a right to be there. It wasn't our lawful tenant. Um, he invited us in. He said he had a tenancy agreement with our tenant. Oh, dear. The man who let Avril in said he'd been living at the flat with his girlfriend for a year, although she'd now moved on somewhere else. He was actually linked financially to the property, as was his, um, you know, girlfriend. They'd been registered there for nearly a year. 
Right. Um, and although he couldn't find me a tenancy agreement at the time, he was pretty cooperative and uh, gave us as much detail information as um, you know we could get at that time. Sure. It turned out the ex-prisoner had been charging the couple more than double the amount he was paying the housing association for the flat. And he'd even put the rent up since the last time he'd unlawfully sublet it. Social housing rent was roughly about £500 a month. The subtenant did say that he paid him £1,100 a month. Right, so he's still making 600 he's quid a month. He's still making quite a fair amount of profit, yes. After Avril's chat with the man living in the apartment, it wasn't long before the official tenant was on the phone, trying to explain himself. The next day, I got contacted by our lawful tenant saying that it's all been misunderstanding and it was a lodger's agreement. He had not a tenancy agreement. While it's against the law for a social housing tenant to sublet their property, it is acceptable to take in a lodger. A spare bedroom can be used to make some extra cash, but the official tenant has to be living in the property. And the permission of the housing provider has to be sought. Avril wasn't convinced by the tenant's claim that he'd taken in a lodger. He did bring in this lodger's agreement that looked like it had been doctored with right. um, dates and amounts of rent changed. And she wasn't convinced that the tenant was still living there. He also said that he had not sublet the whole of the property, but it's only a one-bedroom flat. So um, he then said he was sleeping on the settee, which I find it very difficult to believe that someone would sublet, yeah. you know, or allow <laughs> the bedroom to be used by a couple, and then you're going to be sleeping on mm. the settee. So I'll always, you know, listen to people, but yeah. I, with the weight of evidence that we had, I didn't believe what he was telling us. The Housing Association's priority was to evict the tenant and get the flat back as soon as possible. He had no legs to stand on legally. He had no, um, no defence mm. um, with this case. Um, and because he'd got away with it for so long, he must he maybe thought that he would continue to get away with it and he'd, he'd be able to pull the wool over the court size as well. Yeah. I've actually got the order for possession. £900 of rent arrears and plus our costs as well. Right. Just over £1,300 to have to pay yeah. back. It can be a very long process, but to get that is worthwhile on yep. every single occasion. Indeed. With an order from the court for immediate possession of the property, this desirable flat will soon be in use by one of the 20,000 households on the local waiting list. I don't agree with people that are illegally subletting their council properties. Um, uh, again, I just think it's, I mean, I, I'm a taxpayer and I think that that's wrong and that um, it, it affects all of us, working hard, paying into the system and then there's other people that are abusing the system. I think something should be, do something should be done about the profit being made. I mean, if people are gaining from illegally renting out social housing and taking away from those that need it, then, yeah, they should probably be held accountable for that. It's fraud, and they've forfeited their right to, to um, have that tendency. You know, that's, that's what I believe anyway. In 2014, an estate agent was found guilty of subletting his council property after Southwark Council housing officers visited his home. Checks revealed a signed tenancy agreement between the official occupant and his subtenants, as well as £1,000 having been deposited into his bank account. The week before the court hearing, the subtenants moved out, and the official occupant handed back the keys to the property. However, the court still ordered him to pay back over £7,000. Earlier, we heard how one tenant was claiming to be a single parent, living with his teenage son in a two-bed housing association flat. While in reality, he was actually married and had links with two other social housing properties. The tenant actually had access to three social housing properties, uh, one of which is in Milton Keynes, uh, and then two more in Aldbury. To try and find out what was going on and where their tenant was actually living, Vale of Aylesbury Housing Trust investigator Craig asked for police assistance. I sent uh, a quick request to the police and asked for the neighbourhood policing team just to carry out some general patrols around the area uh, throughout the evening when in all likelihood the, uh, the tenant would probably be asleep. Now if it was to turn out that the car was parked out the address of the wife then um, it would lead us to assume that he's been staying at that address. If that was the case and the tenant was no longer living at his two-bedroom flat, he would be in breach of his tenancy. 
the, uh, the policing team, they carried out routine patrols between 10 o'clock every night and the early hours of the morning, um, and they found that the vehicle that's registered to him was parked outside his wife's address and it was actually parked in the driveway of that property. It was quite clear to us that he was um, staying at that property. As Craig suspected, it seemed the tenant had moved out of his flat and into his wife's home. Nothing wrong with that, of course, but he should have notified them of his change in circumstances and given the keys back. Instead, it seemed he'd allowed his 16-year-old son to stay there. And in the eyes of the law, this was classified as unlawful subletting, regardless of whether or not his son was paying rent to stay there. To find out exactly what was going on, Craig decided to make an unannounced visit. When I got to the address, there was young people on the, on the other side of the door who refused to open, but I could hear that um, there were young people living there. Shortly after Craig's unsuccessful visit, the official tenant contacted him and arranged to meet him at the flat. A few hours later, I received a phone call um, at the office and it was a lawful tenant asking me if I wanted to go back, wanted to know what I wanted, and uh, I went back to the address. He'd met me there and it was quite clear to me that he wasn't actually living there. He'd come back to the property, he'd quickly looked, turned upside down to look like he'd been living there long term, um, but it was quite evident actually that he wasn't living there. His toothbrush wasn't there, for example. He had no clothes, there's no clothes in the wardrobe. Um, the, there's no other footwear by the door, for example. Um, it's all footwear for young people, no, no adult sizes footwear. You know, it's quite clear to me he was not living there. The official tenant was still trying to convince Craig he was a single parent and needed the flat for himself and his son. I asked him some other challenging questions. I said to him, are you married? And he told me that he wasn't married. Um, little did he know that I already had managed to obtain his marriage certificate, so I knew he was married. I interviewed him under caution, so by law he had just incriminated himself. To establish once and for all who was and who wasn't living at the flat, Craig decided to make another surprise visit, and this time he had police back up. A couple of weeks later, we came back to his address again, and this time we came with the police. A young girl came to the door. The young girl was about 16 years old, and she wasn't alone. There were uh, five other people in, in that property. There were sleeping bags there. It looked completely different to how I'd been in the property two weeks earlier. The visit to the flat finally confirmed Craig's suspicions. He decided to interview the tenant again, and this time present him with the evidence. In the early stages of the interview, he was denying our case. He said that we'd got it wrong and that he had been living there. However, once I produced the marriage certificate, once I produced the reports I'd received from the police um, about his daily whereabouts and where he'd be staying in the evening, once I produced to him documents that relates him to another address, he soon backtracked and he admitted under caution that he no longer lives at this address. Craig explained to the tenant that he could be prosecuted for unlawful subletting and if found guilty, he could be fined or even given a prison sentence. As is normal uh, in this type of investigation, when you have proven a case, the, the, uh, the perpetrator will be quite keen to uh, get themselves out of as much trouble as possible and therefore he said, uh, if he hands his keys back in, will we still take action? Um, and as is, normal, as is normal in this type of scenario, he handed his keys back in very quickly. This flat has been redecorated and is now home to a young family. And for Craig, it's job done. I've heard it before where people say tenancy fraud is um, not a serious offence. Many people don't know it's a criminal offence. It is a criminal offence. It carries a custodial sentence. My message to residents of Aylesbury is that if you are going to flout the law in relation to tenancy fraud uh, or any aspect of tenancy fraud is that um, we are working very hard to come and get you. Social housing is extremely important. It's extremely more and more an issue where people are homeless. So I think we have to have a national responsibility for that and I think we have to increase social housing. It's one of the key things in a, in a country, just a, a massive city like London. I mean, there, there needs to be, you know, place, affordable housing for people who really can't afford it, you know, considering the, I mean, the, the height in house prices. There are lots of people who are never going to be able to afford to buy houses. They need somewhere decent to live. But human beings are human beings and should be treated fairly. 
Local authority housing officers aren't just there to look after social housing. They also ensure private housing, which is being rented out to multiple occupants, is being used safely. And it was an inspection of a private property which was the key to opening up this next case. This is a story of lies and fake identity, which enabled one man, Adam Olayla Gidi, to get a council flat and claim housing benefit while all the time owning his own house. In the Royal Borough of Greenwich in South London, they take housing fraud very seriously. Chief Investigator Nigel Brown has helped take back over a thousand properties in the 20 years since he's been in the job. This case came to him after a routine visit by a council colleague who checked on this privately owned house in Plumstead in the east of the borough. The council have a duty of care to make sure that tenants in private accommodation are living in safe accommodation. Um, and one of the duties of the residential services, they visit homes in multiple occupation to ensure just that, that tenants are living in a safe environment. Our residential services team visited this property in September 14 to ensure the tenants inside the property were living in good conditions. The team made some routine inquiries about the landlord and discovered he was a man named Joseph Adebayo. As part of their inquiries, residential services would obtain details of who the landlord was. They found that the landlord of the property was Joseph Adebayo. The council officers ran some checks on the landlord, and when they looked into his bank accounts and investigated his credit references, it seemed he had a second identity. They made checks into Joseph Adebayo, and they identified that he also had another name of Adimola Legidi. As the landlord seemed to have two identities, Nigel and the fraud team got involved. They then referred the matter to us as we deal with all um, criminal investigations and they passed the case to us at that time. Nigel ran the second identity through local authority records and found the name Legidi cropped up on Greenwich Council's radar. He was one of their council tenants. First of all, Nigel needed to find out if the two identities belonged to the same man. Once we had the information from residential services, we looked much deeper into Mr Legidi. Um, we make sure and establish that it is one and the same person. This would involve bank checks, um, identity checks and so forth. Uh, inquiries at all different agencies. They established that the two names did belong to one person because they both had the same date of birth and were connected to the same addresses. There were also links between the bank accounts of the two identities and both names were linked to the same mobile phone number. There's actually no doubt in our minds at all that this is one and the same person. Ultimately, they found his passport details and discovered his full name was in fact Adamole Akimbade Akintoye Legidi. Joseph Adebayo was a fake ID. Now they needed to know how a homeowner came to be occupying a council flat. Legidi had first applied for a social flat back in 2003. The inquiries found that Mr Legidi had applied for housing in 2003, um, basically because he was overcrowded with his family. Mr Legidi was eligible for a social housing flat because the house he was in was overcrowded. He had to wait six years, but eventually in 2009, this flat became available in Greenwich. In 2003, Mr Legidi came to the Royal Borough of Greenwich and basically said that he needed somewhere to live because he was living with his family, with his siblings, it was all overcrowded. In 2009, some six years later, we gave him a tenancy and offered him a, a one-bedroom flat in the premises here. But the investigation revealed that by that time, Mr Legidi had already bought a home of his own in Plumstead, a fact he failed to mention to the council. Instead, he moved into the social housing flat and began letting out his own house to tenants. So on his housing application, uh, Mr Legidi failed to declare that he actually owned any other properties. Uh, and on his form, which I have here, there's a question that asks, do you or anyone moving with you own any other residential property? And to that, Mr Legidi ticked no. Um, had we known that he owned a property, we wouldn't have given him a council flat here or anywhere. And not content with fraudulently occupying a social housing flat, Mr Legidi then made an application for housing benefit. He basically got the tenancy and in 2011, two years later, he then started to claim housing benefit from that address. Once again, didn't actually mention that he owned any property. 
It wasn't until the routine check of his house in Plumstead in 2014 that officers began to suspect Mr Lajidi of wrongdoing. Our inquiries identified that he was the owner of the address, and that was done via a land registry check, uh, which I have. And basically it says that he's owned this since the 16th of December 2005, and that he purchased it for £160,000. None of this was told to us at all, and it was complete, completely kept secret from us. Once the fraud team had the evidence that Lajidi was both a social housing tenant and a homeowner, they called him in for an interview. And we put to him about the fact that he owns the property in Reedhaven Road, and he denied that he was the owner. He said that although his name's on the land registry, it's actually his brother that owns the property, and he simply put his name down on it because his brother couldn't get a mortgage because he lives abroad. None of the evidence supported that, simply because he was also, Mr Lugiri was also the landlord of the property and receiving the rent. There was no indication that any rental money was being paid to his brother. It just didn't stack up. It just didn't seem to be true. The investigation team had all the documentary evidence they needed that Mr Lajidi was defrauding the council and they brought a case against him. Mr Lajidi was summoned to appear at Bexley Magistrates Court and he did attend and he pleaded not guilty to all of the five charges against him. The matter then was passed up to uh, Crown Court and the matter went to Woolwich Crown Court and there Mr Lajidi pleaded guilty to all five charges. Thus, our case against him was proven. When he appeared at Woolwich Crown Court, Mr Lajidi was jailed for 16 months. But as far as Nigel and the fraud team are concerned, that's not the end of the matter. As a result of his fraud against us, Mr Lajidi was sentenced to 16 months in prison. He's currently serving his time now. However, the debt that he needs to pay us back hasn't been repaid. We are now pursuing him for the £70,000 that he owes us and the 20,000 for the benefit fraud. The good thing, Mr Lajidi does own a property in Reedhaven Road. It's got equity, therefore he's got enough to pay us our money back, the whole 90,000 pounds. We are now gonna pursue that through the civil court. Tenancy cheats are abusing one of our nation's greatest assets, our social housing stock. But one by one, those cheats are being stopped in their tracks, thanks to housing investigators pounding the streets and knocking on doors across the UK.